So far we've been discussing the uh, calculating probabilities using the form of z which is equal to x bar minus a mu over the standard error which is sigma over root square of n and we said this is the general form of the z and we explained that you can use this as long as the sampling distribution of the mean is normal and that can happen under two conditions either the x has a normal distribution or uh, the sampling distribution of the mean is normal and that is um, if your uh, if x is normal or if your sample size is greater than or equal to 25 thanks to something called the central limit theorem now here's what happened in real life in real life many times uh, you you don't have a good understanding of what is sigma and therefore you do not have sigma and that creates a problem because uh, you can no longer calculate z and therefore you need to do something. Well, if you remember from the first lectures, um, when we were discussing parameters in, in uh, statistics, uh, sigma was a parameter. It was a real value in the population. And we also said that every time when you do not have the parameter, then you would replace it by its statistics, by its estimate. And therefore the best replacement of sigma is its estimate which is the sampling standard deviation which we've been calling it s okay so we're going to replace sigma with s however so when we do that the, the 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 thing you're calculating is no longer considered to be z uh we give it a new name and that new name is actually what is known as t so it becomes a t, a t test and no longer uh, a z test. Now, um, what is a t? A t is um, is is, is um, uh, has a normal distribution. Okay, so this is a t has a normal distribution, uh, like the z. If you remember when we talked about z, the z had a normal distribution. The t has a mu mu of uh, t which is equal to zero, which is same thing as z. Z has a, had a mu of z equals to zero. Now here's when where things get a little bit different is that the t does not have a sigma t that is equal to one. Otherwise it will be exactly equal to z because both of them have a normal distribution. Both of them are centered at zero. Uh, while the z has a sigma of 1, t does not have a sigma of 1. Well, what is the value of the sigma of t? Well, actually, it doesn't have a specific value because the value of the sigma of t changes. Changes why? Well, because of the s. If you remember the formula of the s at the beginning of the course, we said that s, the standard deviation in the sample, is the sum of square divided by the degrees of freedom and you square root out of that and the way I'm bringing this up is because I want to talk about the degrees of freedom remember the degrees of freedom it was n minus 1 well that degrees of freedom is actually translated to the t so the t as well has a degrees of freedom which is equal to n minus 1 okay so what does that mean well it means as n changes the degrees of freedom changes and the t itself changes the t while it remains normal and it remains centered at zero however its sigma of t is going to change according to the degrees of freedom now the sigma of t by nature is actually greater than 1. And why I'm comparing it to 1? Because the sigma of z is equal to 1. So the sigma of t is greater than 1, which means that if you compare the t to the z, both of them are normal, both of them are centered at 0, but, but t is a bit flatter than the z. If you lay them one on top of the other, the t will always be a bit flatter. However, the t also changes its uh, its, uh, its sigma as the n increases the degrees of freedom increases 
and therefore the sigma of t is going to change. It's going to get smaller and smaller till it reaches a value of 1. And when that happens, the t distribution and the z distribution are exactly the same. Okay. Now, as far as we are considered, this is not going to happen a, a whole lot. It's just going uh, not to happen. Uh, but generally speaking, as you change your, your, your sample size, your degrees of freedom get bigger, the sigma of t gets smaller, and t starts to look more and more like the z. So um, let me show you what I mean by that. Let's suppose, I'm going to start with, uh, let's suppose this is the, uh, the z distribution right here. Okay, so this is the z, it has a mu equal of zero, mu z equals to zero, and it has a sigma of z which is equal to one. Now that's the z, it's well known, well defined. On the other hand, the t, is going to, to be, as we said, it's going to be flatter than the z. So it starts a bit uh, higher, and then it rises not as high as the z, and it starts coming down, and it's flatter than the z. Now this is 1t, and let's, is, let's suppose that this is the t for degrees of freedom. Is that enough? 5. Then if I want to draw the t for degrees of freedom, 3, yeah, and it's the degrees of freedom is actually smaller, then the distribution is going to be more flat. So here you go, it starts flatter, and it rises less than the purple, and it goes, okay? However, if I want to draw a T that has, let's say, for degrees of freedom, uh, 100, well, this one is going to approach a lot the Z. So it's going to be a little bit more flatter than the z, but it's going to look like it a lot. Doesn't rise as much as the z, and I'm sorry. And it's going to be a, just a tiny bit flatter than the z. Okay. Then on 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 the tails, it's higher, and inside it's lower. So that would be the t whole t's. Okay. And um. So what that means, it means that um, if you compare the t to the z, while both of them have a normal distribution, both of them are centered at zero, but while z has a very unique sigma, which is equal to one, the t has a sigma that changes and it's greater than one, but as the degrees of freedom increases, it starts getting more and more close to 1. So the t distribution starts to look more and more like the, uh, the z distribution. Okay, so on the next video, I'm going to show you how do we get the probabilities for the t.